Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue with our discussion, our study of uh, philosophy of sex, love, and friendship. Uh, last time, we focused on that issue of what the experience of another person is. And this time, we're going to just sort of flip that around and ask, what is the experience of, of me? Or what is the experience of, of being a person? Um, and we're, we're going to do that because, you know, we want to understand what kinds of things we are so that we can understand what what the significance of sex and love and friendship is in our lives, in a human life. Right? We're human beings. So that's what we want to understand. We want to understand what human beings are. And uh, to do that, we're going to turn to Aristotle. We read a little bit of Aristotle last time. We read the, that little sh very short selection from Aristotle's politics. Uh, but now we're going to take up Aristotle uh, more seriously in his, in his own right. And we're going to look at uh, his book, uh, The Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, we're going to uh, go enter it at two points. We're going to begin this time by reading some selections from books one and two of the Nicomachean Ethics. And that's basically where he defines human nature, which is the thing we're after today. And then next time, we're going to go on to look at his explicit discussion of friendship in books eight and nine of the Nicomachean Ethics. It's one of the most famous discussions of friendship in the whole history of the world. Um, uh, but yes, that's what we're going to do next time. But now we're going to focus on human nature. And, uh, you know, I use that word nature, human nature. That's, that's probably the word that most defines what Aristotle's philosophy is about. Aristotle is an amazing observer of nature and an amazing theorist about nature. Uh, and and that's, that's, uh, that's his great claim to fame, really. He is an amazing um, insight into what the natural world is and how it works. Um, and so what, what he especially does, you know, he does, he studies everything. He's amazing. Uh, he wrote a ton of stuff about all kinds of topics, but, but the stuff that in a way is the pivot or the, the sort of the focus, central focus of his philosophy and the thing that's essential for our study of human nature is his, his study of natural organisms. And, or you could call them natural life forms. I want to use that expression, life form. Because, and this is kind of his point, or one of his points, like that's what really what you are seeing, what you're witnessing when you go out and see those natural things that you recognize, like a dog or a cat or an oak tree or a tomato plant. Those things are all life forms. And what do I mean by that? I mean... Each one of those things that, that we call, you know, a living being or whatever, is um, a way of existing, a way of living, a form of living, being realized. And that's true in, in at least two different but close, closely related ways. On the one hand, it's, it's true at the, sort of at the level of that thing as an organism, right? A dog has a certain kind of body. Cat has a certain kind of body, and you know, cat bodies are like one another, but they're different from dog bodies, right? So that there's there's a form of life that's that's realized partially as a form of organism, a form of body. But that form of life isn't just a distinctive kind of embodiment; it's also a distinctive life course, a distinctive kind of behavior, right? Dogs do a certain kind of thing; they live a certain kind of life. Cats do a certain kind of thing, a different kind of thing, and they live a different kind of life. Tomato plants live a different kind of life, right? Each, each of those things, when you say tomato plant, you're really saying a kind of life. When you say dog, you're saying a kind of life. And that's true, as I say, both at the level of the bodily realization of that life form, the kind of body that thing is, and the kind of activities that thing behaves in, the kind of behavior that thing engages in. Uh, and so that's what Aristotle is really great at, at studying and analyzing. Um, and in that context, he then says, well, what kind of life form is the human being? And that's really where we're going to start. We're going to begin in book one, chapter seven of the Nicomachean Ethics. And um, one of the things he's asking there, you'll see this in the, in the uh, opening pages of that, of that chapter. Uh, and again, chapter... Don't confuse that with a chapter in a big book. Right? These chapters are short. They're a few pages long. But in the opening paragraphs of this, of this chapter, he says, we, we want to know if there is a thing that, that, that is a goal of, of a human life. Right? He says, is there, a single, is there a single end that all of our actions 
tend towards. An, an end means a goal. Right? Is there something we're aiming at? And he says, uh, yeah, well, yeah, basically we would call it happiness. That's the that's what we say we're all after. And we don't, we're not interested in being happy for the sake of something else. We do other things for the sake of being happy. So happiness is kind of the name for the goal or that which would fulfill our lives. And he says, okay, yeah, that's a good name, but but we want to know what that is. We want to say, well, what is that thing then that we're aiming for if we're going to be happy? And And at that point, he says, well, the way we would answer that is by figuring out what kind of thing we are, what kind of life form we are. If we can figure out what what the character of our way of existing is, then we'll be able to figure out what it would mean to fulfill that. So that's so that question of happiness that that is the point that he's raising in book one, chapter seven. You can see here how that connects with that thing I was saying about nature, in that he says to understand what's going to make a human being happy. We got to understand what kind of a human being, what kind of thing a human being is, and and to understand what kind of thing a human being is, you're going to have to have a sense of what kinds of things there are, what what it, what it is to be a naturally occurring thing, and then to think about what the human being is in that context. And so that's that's the setup. And I, I really want to turn you first of all to to one um, one key paragraph uh, in that chapter uh, where where he makes. Where he where he takes his analysis through there, and um, he says so 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 uh, he's uh, I'm starting now on um, in our translation it's on page twelve. Uh, I'm going to give you the marginal numbers because those numbers in the margin are in all of the different translations of Aristotle. So no matter which which one you're using, if someone tells you the marginal numbers, you can find it. So this is going to be at ten ninety seven b around line twenty. Two or so, and he, and he says this thing I was just saying. Oh, but perhaps saying that happiness is best, uh, even though everybody agrees on it, um, hasn't really been said that uh, distinctly. Um, so he said, may, but maybe we could say it more distinctly if the work of the human being should be grasped. The word "work" there is a Greek word "ergon." Um, means the characteristic activity, and that's the, the sort of thing I was saying before about a life form, the characteristic kind of behavior that, that we engage in. Um, and he says, you know, because just like, you know, a flute player or a sculptor or any kind of expert, um, you know, if you, 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 you figure out what it is to do that thing well if you know what the thing is that you're trying to do. And so he says, well, to figure out what's, what's going to be good for a human being is going to be to know what the thing is that that human being is essentially trying to do as a human being. And so then he says in the next paragraph, and, and this is the, the thing, it, it's, the, it's this next paragraph that really says the essential thing. So this is a paragraph you should read very carefully. You should study it. So he says, whatever then could this work be? And he says, well, for living appears to be something common even to plants. So yes, living is something we do, but that's not the distinctive human activity. I mean, even plants live. Um, so it can't be that. So we could put aside then the idea that um, a life characterized just by nutrition and growth is what would make a human being happy, right? Yeah, we, we want to uh, eat good food and, and grow, like to engage in those basic processes that keep us alive, but that falls far short of defining what it is that makes a human being happy. That describes what fulfills a plant. That's the activity of a plant that needs to be carried on well for a plant to thrive, but human thriving involves quite a bit more than just uh, self-nutrition and growth. Uh, so he says, well, uh, the next thing we might consider is a, a certain life characterized by sense perception, right? Because we also have a, we, we're aware of things, right? So is that what it would take to fulfill us? And he says, well, no, but uh, it, that appears to be common to a horse and a cow and in fact, every animal. So once again, um, we don't thrive just by virtue of our of having our senses stimulated, you know, and just being aware of things. Of course, we would no doubt be unhappy if if our ability to smell nice things and see what's going on around us were taken away from us. Of course, that's relevant, just like self nutrition and growth is relevant. But it's not what defines our distinctive human capacity. And so, uh, so now the next sentence is going to say what that thing is, and I'm going to I'm going to read it and then talk about it for a second. So he says, so there remains a certain active life of that which possesses 
reason. What, what, uh, the, the Greek word there that they're translating as reason is logos. And so he says, so in, you know, if I put that word in, he says, there remains a certain active life of that which possesses logos. And I want to, um, you know, you don't speak Greek and you don't have to go learn Greek, but I do want to draw your attention to that Greek word and, and say it's not quite the same as reason. And so I'm going to go on now to try to say a little bit more exactly what I think logos means. Um, and the word reason here is not an awful translation. It gets, it gets something pretty significant right, but I think it's nonetheless quite a misleading translation. I don't think it really captures what it is that Aristotle is trying to say here. And so I want to tell you what I what I take Logos to mean. And uh, I want you to think about that rather than this notion of possessing reason when you're trying to understand and talk about Aristotle. Uh, so uh, that's where I wanted to get us to first. Now I'm going to talk about that and then I'm going to go on and read more of that sentence in a minute. But yeah, this notion of Logos. Uh, and so this is one of the things about Aristotle. I said he's focused on nature, that which is right. And what's even uh, I, what I should add to that is that his relationship to nature is uh, a very powerful observational one. He's a profound observer, and he, basically he looks at the natural world and and by careful observation uh, discovers what these different organisms show themselves to be. How, how they put on display their ways of living. And that's that's sort of how you learn about nature. Well, so it's in light of that that we want to talk about the human being, right? What what can we observe about people? People are these things that exist in the world. They've been doing it for thousands of years. You yourself have seen thousands of human beings living as well as doing it yourself. And so, so I mean, you know, if you want to understand what Aristotle's going to say, like, basically, you just have to start by trying to observe that and say, like, what do you notice when you see human beings? And uh, we could list a lot of things, you know, that, that would be very different. There would be basically common to people, but very different from what you'd see in other plants and animals, right? We have religions, we have, do science, uh, we write novels and read novels, uh, we've invented money and put prices on things and have bank accounts, um, uh, we, uh, we build all this technology, you know, like houses, rocket ships, cars, computers, uh, winter coats, Right. Um, so I, I'm not going to go through that list. You you could think about that and start thinking about all these these things. And, and you know, with a little thought, you can pretty quickly recognize uh, both that there are a lot of distinctive things that human beings do that dogs and cats don't do. And those things are basically shared throughout human beings all in all different times and all different places. Right? It's not like just something that six people happen to do. Right. And, and like what I'm getting at there is through our living we as human beings, like the plant and the an other animals, show what our what kind of life form we have. And Aristotle, when he says we're the animal or we're the being that um, possesses logos, in addition to the other plant and animal kind of functions, uh, he, uh, he's trying to give a name to that thing that that is on display through all of those things I just named and all kinds of other things you could name. Now, what is that? What, would, what is that basic thing? His answer, I think, is quite interesting. He says, you know, if you look at all that stuff that people do and think, what is the, what is the functioning, the work, that ergon that you're seeing throughout all of that? Um, he, he more or less says, you see people making sense of things. Right, dogs and cats, uh, they don't exactly make sense of things. You know, that's they, they kind of come pre-equipped with a way of responding to their environment. Like for the dog, bones are like smell good and you want to chew them. And cats are things you want to chase, you know. Dogs don't figure that out on their own exactly. Like pretty much every dog is born with that orientation to the world. And so that's why I say they don't exactly make sense of things. We describe that as instinct. They come kind of with instincts. Uh, plants sure, surely aren't doing that, right? They're not, presumably, they're not thinking about anything, right? But the thing about human beings is that we figure stuff out. You know, we land in the world with very few resources. Human beings, as, as animals go, are pretty um, pretty weak. So human babies are just, just die if you dump them into the world. And in a way that other animal babies, I mean, some get going right away. Some have a very, a relatively short period of being cared for and nurtured before they're ready to go off on their own. Human beings, like, woo, takes a long time before they can function on their own. Uh, so in that sense, we're a very weak animal. 
But but on the other hand, we're we're an amazingly strong animal if you think of the things we've been able to do, right? and that's because we we figure stuff out. And and that uh, that's not a translation of logos, but that's pretty close to what it means. the The way I would translate logos uh, is, uh, and when he says you're the animal possessing logos, I would say uh, that's the same as saying you're the animal or the being that can take account of things. The word logos me means a lot of things in Greek, but I think um, uh, the English word that comes closest to capturing all the rich meanings the Greek word logos has is the word account. And I think he's saying we're the kind of beings that can take account of things, the kind of being that can give account an, an account of things. Right? And so when when our translator translates it as reason, it's, yeah, we reason about things. We have that explicit power to think by ourselves, and that's part of what figuring things out means. But logos is more than that because we also say things to each other. We we give an account to other people of our day, you know, and and we listen to accounts other people have given, and that allows us to figure stuff out. And so an, another translation of logos actually would be speaking. So you could say we're the being that speaks, and that would capture some of this. We use language, right? Uh, anyway, like I said, I think the word account is a really good English word for capturing that kind of those two notions of um, figuring stuff out, get, taking account of things, taking account of things, but also expressing things in language and whatever to other people, giving an account. And um, you know, and so our sciences are obviously that. Um, religion is kind of that. We're we, uh, we're trying to figure out what the ultimate nature of things is, and you know. We hold ourselves accountable to, you know, God or whatever we think that ultimate thing is, right? If you think of these different human activities, I think you can see how basically any distinctive human activity you'll name, I think, you'll be able to see that it is derived from or, or a version of that basic human activity of taking account of things. Anyway, that's what he says there. He says, we're trying to find out what happiness is. Is it going to be the life of um, nutrition and growth? No, that may be relevant, but that's not dis the distinctive human life. Is it going to be the life of sense perception? Well, no, that may be relevant, but that's not the distinctive human life. He says, well, what remains is the life of that part of us that possesses logos, that, that side of us, which is the ability to take account of things. And that's what he's going to go on to say about human nature. Um, uh, so we're going to go on to that. I want to just say one more thing, and then we'll get back to the book and see where this goes to. So remember I said at the beginning uh, that I wanted to ask what kind of things we are. Well, that's where I've tried to take us now. The kind of things we are is the kind of being that tries to make sense of things. And so I want you to try to put yourself in that spot and think of others you know, in the world, but especially think of yourself as a kind of being that's trying to make sense of things and um, think about how that might fit. Um, I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'd like you to think about it, but I imagine that some of the things I'm going to go on to say now uh, will uh, affect how you think about that. Um, anyway, but let's, so let's, 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 uh, let's move on. So, so basically he's saying... <clears throat> Where will we find our happiness? Well, we'll find our happiness in fulfilling our nature, basically, fulfilling our distinctive humanity, which means fulfilling that distinctive and definitive human capacity, which is our ability to and our effort to take account of things, make sense of things. Uh, so let's skip to the next sentence from where I left off. So I, I just read, there remains a certain active life of that which possesses Logos. And then he says right after that, and what possesses Logos includes what is obedient to Logos on the one hand and what possesses it and thinks on the other. So I'm going to say those two things he just said, but I'm going to say them in the reverse order. So yeah, we're the being that, that uh, has Logos. And, he, and that comes up in our lives in two ways. On the one hand, we have that specific power to think about things and take account of things. But on the other hand, there is that aspect of our lives which is being obedient to Logos. In other words, it's one thing to figure some stuff out. It's something else to then live in light of that thing you figured out. And so he says, you know, that the, the thing about the human being is like we're defined by the, those two different um, 
sides of this issue of Logos. On the one hand, we're the kind of being who can figure things out. And on the other hand, we're the kind of being who can live in light of what we have figured out, who can be, or fail to be, obedient to what we learn through our taking account of things. Um, and that's what he's now going to go on to talk about. He's going to talk about the human efforts to fulfill those two sides of our logos nature, right? Which, in a, you know, a, a, that looser translation would be our rational nature, right? Uh, but, but as I said, I don't want to stick with that word. Um, uh, but so we're going to talk about those two sides, and, and we're especially going to talk about this side, about the one that's obedient to Logos. So let's skip ahead from Book 1, Chapter 7 now to Book 2, Chapter 1. And I'll just read you the first sentence of that, uh, which would be somewhere around 1103a14, I guess. He says, Virtue, then, is twofold, intellectual and moral. So I'm going to just tell you what that means. Um, so he uses the word virtue. The Greek word is erite, and it's the English translation is virtue is okay. That word could also be translated as excellence. Um, what he means by a virtue um, is having your natural capacity, some natural capacity, developed to an excellent functioning state. That's why it can also be translated excellence. So he's saying, what is human excellence? In, where excellence doesn't mean like getting first prize. Excellent means... Uh, what is that human situation of our having developed our distinctive human capacities to an excellently functioning state? And that's what he calls virtue. So virtue means us as human beings having cultivated uh, our natural potential, our distinctive human potential. And he says virtue takes two forms, intellectual and moral. Well, Intellectual virtue is cultivating to an excellent state that basic ability to think about things, that basic ability to take account of things. So part of human fulfillment means going to school. You go to classes and you get taught things. And partially that means learning, you know, facts about the world, but it also means learning how to use your ability to think. Right? School isn't isn't mostly, maybe not even primarily, about giving you information. It's about getting you to develop your ability to thinking so to think so that you can do that well and that goes along with learning lots of facts and learning lots of information but mostly what's happening throughout all those years of elementary school and high school and then university is the cultivation of your power of making sense of things right so it's you know it's like weightlifting except for your mind rather than your your muscles you know that's that's what education is primarily about formal education. Yeah, facts are important too. But the but the the real thing that's happening and is is you're developing your power of thinking. And so that's what he calls intellectual virtue. Intellectual virtue is bringing your intellect to an excellent state. Um, uh, intellect again it's maybe not the best translation but but it, he's basically talking about that power of logos. So intellectual virtue means developing to an excellent state to an excellently functioning condition your distinctive human ability to take account of things. So learn to do that well. That's what he calls intellectual virtue. But then he says it's also moral virtue. Well, what's moral virtue? Moral virtue is bringing all those other parts of your life that aren't themselves mind or reason or intellect, right? That aren't themselves the power of thinking, but but that are capable of being informed by what you learn in your thinking. Moral virtue is taking all those parts and actually letting them be informed by your thinking, bringing all those other parts of your life um, in line with the, the, the sense you've been able to make of the world through your, your real attempts to take account of things. And so what he calls moral virtue is the way we have taken the things that we learn about making sense of the world and use those things to uh, shape how we live, use those things to shape our behavior. When Aristotle is talking about those parts of you that aren't your actual ability to figure stuff out, but are those things that uh, might or might not be obedient to that 
thing that figures things out. Mostly what he's talking about is your emotions. So uh, what he calls moral virtue here um, can, can also be translated as excellence of character. So he, he's talking here about, when he's talking about moral virtue, he's talking about whether you have developed a good character, which means how, how you have learned to handle uh, things like your, your emotions, things like fear, anger, shame, um, the, uh, desire for pleasure, desire to have stuff, that kind of those kinds of things, those kinds of um, those kinds of feelings that come over you that that are not themselves figuring out things like science, right? So they're not taking account in that sense. But uh, here's the point: when you are afraid of something, when you are angry at something, there is a kind of taking account implied in that. You know, you're angry at someone because you think they have wronged you. Or you're afraid of something because you think it's threatening. And those things, that those, those, those implied claims, you did me wrong, or that thing is threatening, those are not simply straightforward observations of facts. Those are assessments. Uh, and... You know, you can be uh, um, do a better or worse job at dealing with that. You know, sometimes you think someone did you wrong and they didn't do you wrong. That's just you. You know, you have a bad attitude, or sometimes you think certain things are frightening and they're not actually frightening. You're just, uh, you know, you're just uptight, right? So some. Uh, what I'm what I'm saying there is, uh, in anger or or fear, th those are attitudes in which we impute something to the object. We say that it has a certain character, but we're not always right about that. And quite often we impute something to the object when the truth of the matter is really there's something going on with us. Right? So the, the point I'm trying to make there is you can see how in our anger or our fear, a kind of taking account is involved. Um, and so the, so the issue is then, in your emotional life, where you get angry at things or where you're afraid of things, or, or, or alternatively, where you don't get angry at things and you aren't afraid of things, the, the question is, is, that, is the kind of taking account that's implied in that, is it good or bad? Is it, is, is it, um, does it measure up to the standards of taking account of things well? So Aristotle said that these other parts of us can be persuaded by logos, even though they are not themselves logos. Um, that means in the way human beings handle their emotions, a kind of taking account is always going on. A kind of assessment is always going on. And the question is whether the way our emotions have been persuaded to take account of things is doing a good or a bad job of actually obeying the good use of taking account. I hope that made reasonable sense. Well, let me now read a passage in Aristotle uh, that I hope will um, make the things I was just saying a little bit clearer. So this is this is now the um, the second paragraph of uh, Book 2, Chapter 1. And this, again, is a paragraph I would say you should really focus on. So I told you that earlier paragraph you should really focus on, and this one you should really focus on. So, so, he, so basically what he's saying here is moral virtue, our, our character, isn't something that just comes to us naturally. Right? The, the, you have a character, and that is your way of behaving, your developed way of behaving. But you weren't born with that. That's something you developed. And so, uh, so he says here, um, uh, the virtues are not things that come to us by nature, but, but we are of the nature that we are able to receive them. And that's what he's about to explain. So he says, in the case of things that are present in us by nature, we first have the capacity and then later on display the activity. Right? So like um, the child is born with the ability to speak language. The human child is born with the ability to speak language. Uh, that's a natural capacity, but she's only going to learn it over time, and, and she's going to 
develop the activity because she already has the ability. Or again, um, walking would be the same. The child will learn how to walk even though she was born with the ability. Uh, we have the ability to see, and it's because we're born with the ability to see, presuming you know, you're not born blind, but uh, if you're born with the ability to see, it's because you already have that ability that you will then be able to use it to see. Right? That seems pretty obvious and straightforward, right? Um, uh, so he's, as he says, it's not the result of seeing many times or hearing many times that we come to have those abilities to perceive, right? Rather, uh, we have those abilities first. It's, it's because we have those abilities that we use them. But the virtues are the opposite. But the virtues we come to have by engaging in the activities first, as is the case with the arts. And then he explains that. So he says, you know, if you, if you think of what it's like to be a guitar player, I play guitar. I'll probably play some guitar in the class at some point to make a point. Um, but, you know, I think of what that was like. Like at some point, uh, actually when I was seven, my sister, my brother had a guitar and my sister brought it over to me and she showed me how to put my fingers on it. And I, like it was really hard to get my fingers in the right place. And I had to do, you know, pluck the strings over here, you know, and it was, didn't didn't work very well. Like I, you would you would rightly say he doesn't know how to play the guitar. He doesn't have, he, he's not a guitar player. But I was actually pushing down the strings and doing this. And it was by that activity of actually playing that I became someone who was able to play. Right? And that's that's true at more and more developed levels, right? The 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 it's by doing things of a certain kind that you become a person who can be said to really have the ability. It's by playing the piano that you learn how to play the piano. It's by skiing that you learn how to ski, right? Uh, it's by doing carpentry that you learn how to do carpentry. Right? So in the, and th those things, th those, those are the arts, right? And those things, you do the practice first, and that makes you the person who we would then say, oh, that's a person who has that capability, right? So in, in the case of the arts, it's the opposite of what, of what happens with our natural abilities. With natural abilities, we have the power first, and then we just use it. With the arts, we have to develop the power, and we develop it by doing that art, just doing it, you know, not very well at first. Um, and that is what we would normally call the development of a habit. So with habits, um, something as simple as tying your shoe, for example, uh, you tie it many times, and that's how you learn to tie the, to tie the shoe and become a person who is able to tie shoes. So the habits are these things where you do it, and somehow those events kind of, uh, those activities kind of stick, and then you develop the ability. Um, and he says that's what the virtues are like too. And I'm going to come to that in a second, but let me just read this one line first. He says, uh, this is still in that paragraph I was saying you should read. For as regards those things we must learn how to do, those things that we have to learn how to do, we learn them by doing them. For example, by building houses, people become house builders. By playing the kithra, the guitar, they become kithra players. And then he says the thing about virtues, right? The moral excellent. By doing just things, we become just. By doing moderate things, we become moderate. By doing courageous things, we become courageous. Um, and then let me skip down to the next paragraph, which is also quite important. He says, this, this actually I think is really worth thinking about carefully. Further, as a result of and on account of the same things, every virtue both comes into being and is destroyed, as is similarly the case with an art. For it is as a result of playing the kithra that both good and bad kithra players arise. So in other words, if you if you uh, if every time you practice playing the guitar, you practice doing it well, you'll become a good guitar player. But if you practice doing it poorly, you become a poor guitar player. Uh, and he says, um, so too in the case of the virtues, uh, by doing things in our act in our interactions with human beings, some of us become just, others unjust. By doing things in terrifying circumstances. And by being habituated to feel fear or confidence in those contexts, some of us become courageous, some cowards. Uh, the case is similar as regards desire and bouts of anger, etc. So, so the point there then is that uh, um, moral excellence, excellence of character, is developing your emotional responses in a way that is appropriate to the demands of situations. 
Um, and But the way we actually develop them is by habituation. So we become just people by practicing just actions. We become unjust people by practicing unjust actions. And those things that are initially just individual actions eventually turn into our character. Right? And so now the next little part there, he says, in a word, the characteristics come into being as a result of the activities akin to them. Uh, Hence, we must make our activities of a certain quality, right? We, we should do things well in order to become good people. Uh, for the characteristics we develop will correspond to those activities. It makes no small difference then whether one is habituated in this way or that way straight from childhood, but it makes a very great difference. Indeed, it makes the whole difference. So the point is then, going back to that situation of you being afraid or you being angry, uh, implied in the things you're angry about or uh, afraid of is an account of them. And so you became habituated to a way of taking account of situations. You became habituated to interpreting those kinds of situations as threatening. You became habituated to interpreting those kinds of situations as injustice being done to you. And that so you you cultivated a characteristic way of responding with fear or with anger uh, on the basis of a history of becoming habituated to certain kinds of interpretations. And that happened when you were a little kid. That happened basically in the way you were raised by your parents. Uh, and so in your emotional life now, your emotions have been persuaded to take account of things in a certain way. And that may or may not be closely aligned with what good taking account on its own terms would dictate. Uh, okay, so that's book two, chapter one. So book one, chapter seven is basically where he defines the human being and, and gives you this idea that we possess logos. Book two, chapter one is really he sh where he really shows you the point of that and the idea that the thing about human beings is that we have a character. We don't just have a nature, we have a character. And that character is the way we have become habituated to a way of taking account of things, or the, I could use the language I learned used at the very beginning, our way of making sense of things at an emotional and behavioral level. And uh, we might have developed that well. There's a good chance we developed it poorly. That's where a lot of our hang-ups sit. Um, uh, I just want to say a couple more things, and then I'm going to leave it there uh, for 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 this uh, for this lecture. Um, but I just want to say a couple more things about that notion of moral virtue. Um, in in um, book two, chapter two, he says that the basic characteristic, uh, or sorry, the basic style of uh, having good character of a of a virtue is is um, knowing how to respond in a way that is appropriate to the circumstances. So good, good behavior, good, good, a good emotional response reflects a good assessment of the realities of you in relationship to the realities of the environment. Uh, a poor assessment uh, he, he says is a matter of excess or deficiency. Like you, uh, in the context of fear, for example, you might be overly fearful, in which case we'd call you a coward, right? And that would be uh, not assessing appropriately how frightening the thing is, but but thinking it's, thinking it's m more worthy of fear than it is. Or you might be someone who underestimates that, and you, you're a person who's um, rash, you go into situations you shouldn't go into. You have a habit of just charging into dangerous situations because you don't acknowledge how serious the danger actually is. You know, like maybe you're driving a car with your two-year-old son in the back seat, and uh, you think, "Oh, I can make that red light. I don't have to worry about other cars." And you just go ripping through. You know, that's rash. Um, that is you not assessing realistically how dangerous the situation is with the consequence that maybe you're going to, you know, kill your son, right, when you get in a car accident. Um, so uh, knowing uh, how, uh, how frightened you should be is actually 
a matter that, that's what good character is and that's a matter of taking account well but we can be cowards or rash people that is to say we can have become habituated to being deficient or excessive in our assessment of how uh how frightening things are and so he's so the, those, and those are vices those are bad habits right those are bad those are that's that's where you become habituated to bad ways of responding so those are matters of excess and deficiency and it, the word he uses for doing it well is what he calls the mean and that really that what that means is uh, as i said before being able to assess appropriately what is called for um, so he says that at, uh, in, at uh, book two chapter two he says that uh, for, uh, around um 1104a 24 uh, he's talking about moderation and courage and he says moderation and courage are indeed destroyed by excess and deficiency but they are preserved by the mean so you can see it there in book two chapter six uh, he goes on and talks a little bit more about the mean, and that's that's uh, um, pretty significant. That's one of the things I assigned. But I want, and I, but I just want to read you one sentence from that. So he says, "What is it like to? Do, what, what does it mean to do something appropriately?" And he says this at uh, 1106b, about 21. He says, uh, "Yeah, you you can. It's fine. You, sometimes you're going to be angry. Sure. Sometimes you're going to be afraid. The issue isn't that you should never do those things. It's that you need to do them right." So he says, "But to feel them when one ought." And at the things one ought, in relation to those people whom one ought, for the sake of what one ought and as one ought, all these constitute the middle or, or the mean, as well as what is best, uh, which is in fact uh, what belongs to virtue. So I just wanted to read you that passage where he sort of says, um, responding well means responding as you ought to, which means responding to what the situation really calls for rather than projecting your hang-ups on it. Um, and then I just want to say one more thing about chapter 7. He goes through there and talks about what some of these moral virtues are. Uh, courage is one. Uh, moderation is how they translate this word sofrazune, and that, that means being able to con control yourself reasonably in relation to pleasures and pains. Um, generosity, uh, there are a few others in here, so you should see the list. There's about a dozen that he talks about here in um, in Book Two, Chapter Seven. But what he does there is he he shows you, or he just lays out, you know, here is what we think of as the appropriate handling of your emotions and your behavior with respect to this issue. Here's here's what it is to be deficient. Here's what it is to be excessive. So I talked about courage already. You know, courage is the mean. Cowardness is is a vice of uh, excessive estimation of fear and rashness is the vice of deficient um, estimation of the level of, of danger and so on right so he goes through that with all of them so you should read that to, to think about these things so I just want to, that's that's the reading I just want to go back and quickly sum this up and then wrap it up for here uh, so wh what are we talking about here so what I've been trying to do in this in this uh, lecture is use Aristotle to introduce the notion of our distinctive human nature and um, and he brings that out by saying that yeah we you know we have plant-like characteristics we have animal-like characteristics but we also have this distinctive thing that we possess the ability to take account of things and and so I'm looking at that because it's it's pretty insightful and so that's the that's him saying basically what a human being is what you are and so he he says in light of that we can understand the needs of a human being and what it will take for us to develop well to thrive which he's saying is basically what happiness is going to amount to 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 doing well at being the kind of thing you are flourishing as a human being the way a plant with sunlight water and food flourishes as a plant right you really are in a position to uh, flourishingly develop your human capacities when you know, you cultivate this these basic functions to an excellent state. Uh, and so basically saying that's what we as human beings need to, to thrive, to flourish, to be happy and healthy. We need to develop our ability to take account of things. In, in another one of his works called The Metaphysics, book, book one, chapter one of The Metaphysics, he's, his first sentence is, all human beings by nature strive towards knowing, right? So he's saying it's natural to human beings to want to know. And so when we go out to school and study things, like we're fulfilling something in our nature. So human beings should study. We should we should cultivate our abilities to take account of things, which is what he calls intellectual virtue or excellence of thought. Uh, but the thing we're focusing on is so much of being a human being is not just the, 
the precise activity of thinking though it, and it's it's a it's our behaving in all these other ways uh, uh, with a kind of emotional base and he's saying that that's really that's really the core of what happy and healthy human development is about it's about becoming a person it's, be, it's becoming a good person becoming happy as a person is corresponds actually to becoming good as a person because it, it amounts to um, cultivating your native powers to take account of situations well and have that actually reflected in the way you behave and that's a matter of cultivating our emotional responses to things and you know behaving you know appropriately but the problem is those are things that we we developed through our childhood habituation and we often didn't develop those things that well so as adults we can easily be in a kind of a mess where we have actually pretty bad habits of behaving we may, we maybe we're cowards or maybe we can't control ourselves around eating or um, get angry that's a big one it's just you know and so by the time we're adults we find ourselves already having developed a kind of moral character and what really what we really need is to put that in a healthy state and that means uh, learning how to bring our emotions uh, into line with the demands of logos with the demands of taking account of things well so I want you to read those sections to get that basic account and from that to get a sense of what he's saying about what we need as human beings and I feel like most people you should think oh yeah right probably I have some work to do there right I'm hoping that you can read these things and see that that speaks to realities in your own life and and this um, some often a disparity between the ways you actually behave and you know what good sense would really call for um, anyway I hope that gives you a helpful entry into thinking about the human condition through Aristotle's eyes that's what we're gonna do this time when we come back we're gonna look at his analyses uh, of friendship as they fit into this so this is gonna be the background for that but for the moment I really just want you to think about his account of the distinctive character of human being and the particular meaning of this notion of of moral virtue <laughs>